Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So he is identified as the king of the Jews by the Magi. Um, and Palm Sunday, uh, where it, he's making reference to the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, and it's cited here in Matthew 21, verse 5, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. And this is uh, the, one, the time we see him called king. And it, otherwise, we have the parables of the kingdom, but it's very rare that he's actually called king except for the Magi, Zechariah making reference to him uh, at, for Palm Sunday, and then he calls himself king in this parable of the last judgment. So that's something that's rare in Matthew, but therefore all the more important because it's rare. And we see that instead of proclaiming himself as king, our Lord really focuses on the kingdom because his goal is to invite us to belong to his kingdom. That's his goal. That's the reason God became flesh so that we could come into the kingdom of God. That's why he says, as already quoted earlier in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also we see the same thing in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, at the beginning of the ministry, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the kind of thing that we see uh, here and with the many parables of the kingdom. Now, in response to the king saying this to the righteous, the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked or clothe thee? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? So they are perplexed. They don't ever recall seeing him in those conditions. They're completely surprised at the criteria that the king is using. They're not saying, oh yeah, yeah I, I really was pretty good at doing that, wasn't I? No, they're totally surprised. And this is how he responds. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So whatever you do to the least of your, the brethren, you do to Jesus. Now, he then, let's be, before I comment on that, let's go to the condemnation of the goats. Don't want to be one of the goats. He said to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Now, in response to that, the wicked protest. They say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? He will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now, this is a very interesting criterion. And it's interesting how both the goats and the sheep are unaware of the criteria being used to judge them. They're unaware that they were doing or neglecting to do anything for Jesus. 
completely unaware. And as a result, we see that the Lord, first of all, is going to judge people by his standards, not by the standards people bring for themselves. If I had my own standards, I would do pretty well. In fact, people would be writing a lot of things about me and thinking, oh, yeah, this guy's really good. That would be if you go by my standards. But you don't. And neither, and certainly neither does God. Everybody will be judged by the standards he lays down. That's the power of being the son of man, to have those standards that he applies independently of what anybody else thinks of themselves. And that's very important. And it says that the wicked will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, this is also something that um, I think we have to consider here that we, um, you know, have to understand that what is at stake in the final judgment is eternity. This life is short. And even some of the people I've been privileged to meet who are 100, there was a priest here in town who lived to be 101 years old just down the road from here. And uh, he was really sorry. He said, uh, I wish I could live to be 125 because then I'd be a priest for 100 years. I'd be the longest priest they ever had. <laughs> but he didn't make it. But he and the other folks would say, I don't know where the time went. Now, when people are sick, it seems to drag on. But most of them will say, well, the time went by so quickly. But eternity never stops. And neither hell nor heaven will ever stop. They have no end. And that's why this is so important. Now, it's also important to keep in mind, this parable, if you look back on verse 31, is addressed to the nations. In Hebrew, it would be the Goyim. These are the people outside the family of faith. They'd be outside of Israel, and they would be, in effect, outside the church. That's why they don't know that they did anything to Jesus. But here's something else we have to keep in mind. There are a lot of people who think superficially about such matters. And that, oh, they'll say, well, there are many ways to, to God and Jesus is just one of them. No, that's not true. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. There's only one name under heaven by which you can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. And here that applies in this way, that whatever they did that was righteous or whatever they failed to do that was righteous, Jesus counts as being done to him. But he uses the weakest people, the least people, the smallest people. And that you do to them what you do to Jesus. This is why it is a demonic trick for Catholics to say, well, I'm a Matthew 25 Christian, I take care of the poor, and at the same time support abortion and euthanasia. Because what you do to those babies or whatever laws you support to do to those babies, you are doing that to Jesus Christ. What you do to the sick and dying in helping them to die before their time, you are doing that to Jesus Christ. And you and I will answer for what we do to the least of our brethren. And you support 
cutting babies into pieces or poisoning them or killing them with saline treatments that are just tor torment them. You do any of that, you are doing that to Jesus. You don't know the baby. He does. And whatever you do to save a life and help bring somebody up and raise them and feed them and care for them and clothe them, like it happens in most of the pro-life clinics, the vast majority of them do take care of food, clothing, and prenatal and postnatal care. They do focus on They're doing that to Jesus. And that will determine who's a sheep, who's a goat, and where you end up. And this is something we cannot afford to neglect. Well, I'm not in favor of abortion, but, you know, I, I like somebody who is, and I'll support them. You're supporting them against Jesus and his least little ones. And this is something all of us must consider. Now, we're going to take a break. I want to come back and sort of pull together some elements about these parables that we've been discussing. So please stay with us and we'll get to uh, your questions and comments as well. Many of Father Mitch Pacwa's books are available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. To get your copy of any of these works, including his book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church, log on to our web store, EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, President Joe Biden has officially announced his re-election bid for 2024. We have reaction at the White House. Plus, Sudan has entered a three-day ceasefire after 48 hours of negotiations. How other countries are responding. Join us tonight. My life is one mess of lies from dawn till dusk. It didn't bother me to begin with. But it bothers you now. I used to be of the world. But what the world calls failure, I've come to see as the merciful action of God. I live for him now. Wretched sinner that I am. You seem to know a lot about the church. We're in the front line of the battle. I could have lied to you, but I didn't. Why didn't I? I shall pray heartily that one day you will be victorious over yourself and find your one true friend, our Lord and Saviour. back. Just to review what we've been discussing, you know, this chapter of my book is entitled, The Church Will Always Contain Sinners. That's not just a sociological observation. It's something that our Lord knew would be the case. He had lived among human beings for 30 years before, you know, starting his public ministry. He certainly knew, but with his divine knowledge, the inner thoughts of many, as we see throughout the Gospels, he knew what was in the hearts and minds 
sometimes better than they themselves. And it's very important to be aware that he had said there are going to be sinners and saints in the church. He includes it in the parables, as we've seen, whether it be the wheat in, uh, to which of various weeds or tares were sown by the devil, or whether it be in the net with the good fish and the bad fish, whether it be in the sheep and the goats gathered together at the end of the world, whether it be the five wise and the five foolish virgins, or whether it be the one lazy servant and the two good ones, or whether it be the prudent and righteous leader of the church, the good steward, or the imprudent and wicked servant, you know, the wicked steward. This exists, and it exists not only in the general run of the church, but also among clergy. This has been true throughout history. You read uh, in the first century, there were people like Simon Magus who wanted to buy the power to give the sacraments. He wanted the power to buy the power of uh, giving confirmation and the Holy Spirit to people. You have uh, St. John mentioning people who were uh, as randy as goats, that they were you know, causing all kinds of sexual misconduct in the first century. And when you go throughout the history of the church, you see this repeated on into our own times. Our Lord knew that. He, was, he prepared us for it with these parables. And he will correct the situation. He will reward the righteous, and he will punish the wicked. The parables say that over and over again. Jesus does not ever say, oh, it's okay. All of you just come to heaven. <laughs> That's not in my Bible. No, it's that he's going to do that judgment. And in the face of this, you know, many people are scandalized. And the word skandalizo means, in Greek, to cause to stumble. This... This is what I like to say, that the devil gets a twofer. He gets a two-for-one sale on temptation. He tempts one person to sin and then causes other people to, scandal, uh, to commit scandal because of that sin. And they leave the church because somebody else did something bad. That's a two-for-one sale on, on temptation. And he likes that. If we're going to learn from our blessed Lord, wisdom would teach us that we should be alert to the reality that people inside the church will cause scandal. They will commit sin. They will be wicked. And we've seen that in the church with the sexual scandals and with financial scandals. And some people, especially in, right now in our culture that is so divided by ideology, now I'm hearing that college kids don't want to go to states that have ideologies different than their own. They're afraid to go to colleges in states that aren't as conservative as they are or as liberal as they are. They can't cope with you know, this because there's so much tension and that goes on. And sometimes you'll hear people bring that foolishness into the church and say, well, if those liberals would just straighten up, we wouldn't have these scandals. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be true because there are clergy who are solidly orthodox that sin, as well as you know, those who would be progressive that sin. And there's some progressives who live a very virtuous and simple life. And, you know, it, it, 
it's not always along the lines of the ideology I side with and that the other people are the ones causing the trouble. Human frailty transcends even theological ideology. And that's very important to remember. This happened plenty of times. And each of us has to examine our own hearts and minds so that we choose to do what is righteous and we do everything we can to fight against temptation. We do whatever we can to be righteous and to avoid wickedness, to move on to that straight and narrow pathway to heaven that's hard, or and to avoid the wide and easy road to hell. And by the way, that description of the road to heaven, the road to hell is not mine. That comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord Jesus said that the way to hell is wide and easy, and many are they who go upon it. And given the way we've seen an increase of violence and even the condoning of violence and neglecting to punish it and stop it, we can assume that the way, the wide way is getting more full and more crowded, as our Lord warned. And we have to do whatever we can to correct our weaknesses and avoid wickedness. We have to avoid being self-centered and instead focus on serving Christ. And the more we focus on Him, the more we will recognize the inherent dignity He pours out on the least of His brethren. We will see them as our brothers and sisters, never to be used and never to be abused, but always to be cherished and helped on their way to heaven. This is what our Lord would bring forth from us. And we see in the Gospels that our Lord chose 12 apostles and 70 other disciples who had these same kinds of tensions within them. They were not perfect people by any means. They were not without sin. And he chose them. And so keeping that in mind, I'd like us to take a look to a little bit about the apostles during the public ministry and our Lord's choice of the apostles. Now, let's take a look. at This is actually the next chapter of my book. And in this, we see how all four Gospels portray that 12 men were chosen as apostles. And they were willing to leave their former way of life and follow Jesus. But at the same time that they were willing to leave everything, leave their nets and their boats and their tax collectors table and all this, they're willing to leave that and follow Jesus. But at the same time, they are shown to be filled with envy and ambition and greed and, you know, anger. You know, they had all sorts of vices. And our Lord didn't say, well, I guess that's okay. You know, I understand you had a tough growing up. No, that's not what he says. He corrected their vices and corrected their behavior. And he did it both in private and he did it in front of the crowds. That was his way. And this is what, you know, he did for them. And it's very important to note that these are very honest portrayals. The apostles 
don't write gospels saying, ah, we got everything Jesus said. We knew what he was talking about. It was those dummies in the crowd that didn't get it. So no, no. That's not what you see. They talk about, and where did the evangelists get these stories about Jesus correcting the sins of the apostles? From the apostles themselves. St. Mark and St. Luke certainly were not there, but they heard from the apostles. They taught him. In fact, St. Mark was the secretary for St. Peter. It's called an amenuensis in Greek. And as his secretary, he has Peter looking worse than in, he does in any of the Gospels. The other Gospels show Peter a lot more respect. But in the one that he gave over to Mark, in the gospel that has Peter as its background, he looks the worst because Peter told Mark to write those stories. That's the kind of humility he had. And the gospels lay out the failures of their authors, like Matthew and John and the other apostles, with only two exceptions, Jesus and the Blessed Mother. So they don't have any sins, but everybody else does. So we see these very honest presentations of the flaws of the apostles throughout the Gospels. And the uh, matter of fact, St. Peter is mentioned more often than anybody in the gospel except Jesus. A lot of folks don't realize that, but his name is mentioned more often than anybody else except Jesus. And you can see that he doesn't look so good. We oftentimes point out uh, that he was like that and that he was a problem. And it's, as a matter of fact, so much is written about their failures. I can remember how for years Mother Angelica would read stories about and said, what a bunch of dodos. Now, toward the late 90s, I pointed out to her, Mother, I noticed that you haven't been calling the apostles dodos as much as you used to. Are you getting a little nervous as you're getting closer to meeting up with them? <laughs> Just wondering. This is a little question I had for her. I told that story up at the convent last week when I was uh, uh, joining the sisters to, uh, um, to, to, you know, to celebrate Mother's birthday. But it's important that these apostles have this honesty about themselves. It's typical of Israel. And Israel uh, also showed that honesty. They include the stories of Moses' murder of a man, David's murder and adultery, Solomon's 1,000 wives and the foolishness that caused. There's a humble honesty in Israel's presentation of its own history that you don't see in the other literature. You don't see that uh, in literature about the Egyptian pharaohs or the kings of some of the other countries. We see that these humble men who wrote about their own failures and admitted them are a very important source of meditation for every Christian, all of us need to reflect on them. We can, and what we'll do in the next couple of, next few weeks is talk more about the apostles and how we need to see our own lives reflected in their failures. And that just because we're like them, we, that's not permission to be bad. Uh, but all of us have to invite Christ to correct our sins very much the way that the sins of the, you know, the apostles were corrected.
That would be the purpose of some of these meditations. And that therefore we can have this deeper light, this deeper insight into Jesus as we put ourselves in the place of the apostles and realize I'm like them and I need Jesus to purify me, or as he says in John 15, to prune the sin away from me so that I can bear more fruit. And that's a choice we have to make. Will I be honest with myself, whether I'm a priest or a bishop or a layperson, religious, and will I let Jesus correct me? This is the question that should be there for us as we approach our discussion of the apostles, and we'll begin that next week. All right, we'll stop there, and we will now go to some of the questions. We have a caller, Sister St. Clair. Are you on there? I'm here. Hi, Sister. Where are you from? Oceanside, California. Oh, what a nice place. It's a lovely place. Yeah, my dad used to live there when he retired until he died. He lived out that way, just to the west oh, of yes. it, over on Bobeer. So what can we do for you this fine day, sister? Well, I have one comment, if I may make it after my question, uh, sure. after my little discussion about sure. the scripture you read. Um, I don't see in that first uh, part where Jesus is talking about separation from uh, the evil people from the good people. Mm -hmm. I don't see where that re directly ref uh, is regarding the church itself. I mean, he doesn't say church through, through any of it, as far as I can see. No, do you remember who he's addressing? Well, he's ad I don't know. Who's he addressing? It says there, he will come seated on a cloud with his angels to judge the nations. Right, the nations. But so not the this church. is everybody. Yeah, everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's what you meant with everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then I misunderstood you as the first uh, time you went around that as being the church. Okay, so that's. But, but it, of know, course. Got that straightened out. Yeah, yeah. And it would apply to members of the church. We're going to be judged by this, but also by higher standards because we do know of Jesus. Of course. Yeah. That, yeah. Agreed. The yeah. second uh, point is, uh, I thank you so much for your diatribe on abortion. Uh, it's so needed. I wish more priests would do it and talk about it and the horror of it. And I think if people knew what really went on in an abortion, I don't mm. think they'd vote for Joe Biden. But, yeah. and, you, you know, we also, we can't vote for a pro-abortion candidate. But that's a contributing to abortion. See, because this he's is, promised that he's going to forward that. See, here's the thing that I would say about our politicians. It would have been wrong for us to vote for pro-slavery people back in the 1850s and 40s and 30s. That would have been wrong. And people look back on that era with shame. At the time, it was a lively debate, and people were saying, well, we need slaves. And all. But you look back on that and you say, what a shameful way to treat people. And the church, by the way, had been very clear. We've talked about it many times. The, uh, we had a show recently about that um, with a, a professor of philosophy from California, uh, Dr. Edward Fazer. And, you know, the, the church was absolutely clear that enslaving people was a mortal sin that brought automatic excommunication. You didn't need a decree of excommunication. It was automatic, just like abortion does. And we have to realize that as we are and should be ashamed of enslaving people in the past, so, and of racial bigotry and other terrible things, we should also be ashamed of any support for this very wicked deed. And if you don't think it's wicked, I would, and as sister, you seem to have a good sense of this, 
I would challenge anybody to watch the ultrasound of an abortion. You can see it in a uh, movie, it's online, called um, A Silent Scream. Watch it, I dare you. Most people who support abortion are too cowardly to do so. But watch it and then say, well, it's just, just a bunch of cells. Not the way that little baby is punching and kicking against the knife that cuts his arms and legs off and crushes his skull. No, no, no. This, the, all these things that we do to the least of the brethren, as well as dealing with the poor and helping out those in need and the homeless, these are all things we must do. It's not one or the other, but we have to do whatever we can and support those who are the least. Well, we're going to take a little break. We'll come back in a couple minutes with more of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. Hello, family. At the Annunciation, the Blessed Mother said yes to God and yes to life. Today, we can follow Mary's example and defend life at all stages. We all know that it's not easy to be pro-life in the 21st century, as some declare that they have a right to take the life of an unborn child. But the dignity of life is central to our faith and essential to all of us at EWTN. Our Foundress, Mother Angelica, fiercely defended life and we carry on her work every day, thanks to you, our EWTN family. With programs and specials like EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, the coverage of annual marches from Washington, D.C. and worldwide, as well as websites and other content, we declare the sanctity of life for the unborn, the sick, the suffering, and for people of all races and nationalities. But we need your help today as we share this message with more people around the globe. With your support, we'll continue proclaiming the value of life from conception to natural death, because we cannot be silent when it comes to protecting life. Thank you, and may God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Your gift today keeps EWTN on the air and shares the joy of the gospel with the world. Please make a gift by going to EWTN.com slash Giving. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will welcome Michael Heinlein to discuss the life and witness of Cardinal Francis George, who as a young man was told that because of a physical disability, he would never be made a priest in Chicago. Yet, he was ordained a priest in my hometown, the Windy City. He was consecrated the Archbishop of Chicago and made a cardinal, prince of the church. Eight years after his death, he remains a model for discipleship and leadership, and we want to discuss more about his life. So that'll be good. It was, uh, as a matter of fact, he grew up just uh, oh, about a mile and a half away from where I grew up, so it'll be fun to talk about that. All right, let's get some of your questions and comments. Let's start off with John in West Virginia. John. What can we do for you? Hey, Father, how are you doing today? Can Find you hear this me? frog hair. <laughs> Ever seen frog hair, John? 
The, the, you're talking about the winter after winter? No, well, before, all year long. Is that, you can't see it, and that's how fine I am. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. Uh, they told me to keep it brief, so I'll Yeah, what you got? Okay, I try to keep it brief. I, I am Catholic, and I have two good friends, uh, one college teacher, so and smart people, and they told me something that brought me in. Uh, I had to go see the deacon about it, and they said, uh, if you should sin, John, and, and, and whatever amount of sins, and you didn't repent, you're going straight to hell. So I took it, I disagreed with him. I said, if that's the case, then sin is greater than salvation. He said, well, we'll see about that. I said, well, let's go. I'll, I'll, I'll meet with the deacon. The deacon says, well, Mr. Fassler, and, and talked to the college teacher, too. He said, well, salvation will always prevail over sin. He said, if that's why we have purgatory, and, and, and I would... I know Protestants say, well, it's a judgment. Uh, the good mm-hmm. works will be rewarded. Mm-hmm. Bad ones will be burned up. Am I in the right direction? That's what I'm worried about. Because these two men are very devout Catholics. They say they are. They go to Mass every day, Father. Yeah. Here they are. Here's, but, here's, but, I, yeah. but I throw the curveball in on them. You, I don't think you ever heard this. No, so, no, it, it, it's not that different from what, you know, the, the, what I've heard before. It's not that much a curveball at all. Here's one of the problems that you're thinking about salvation and sin as quantities, that sin will never outweigh salvation. And that's true, because sin is a limited act by creatures or limited uh, choice by creatures. And so, you know, it's, it's inherently limited, while salvation is the infinite gift of the infinite God. So it's greater. But using quantity pictures in our minds and imaginations is not really going to get at the issue. The issue is this, that we very much have to see this as a relationship. If you are married and you're in a relationship with your wife, and then you do something really stupid. You, for instance, I remember being at a convention in uh, Las Vegas, and the guy sharing the elevator was telling his friend, I just lost $45,000. Say, if you do something stupid like that, you have some repairing of the relationship to do. If you went and said, I'm going to gamble to get it back, and then you lose the house, you may have lost your family too. You know, a wife might say that I can't live with you because you're so irresponsible. And you break the relationship. So it's not just the amount of money. But it's that a person is breaking the relationship. And the same thing applies to God. It's not just the the quantity of the sin, but the need for confession with a firm resolution to amend your life is that you have to restore the relationship. Now, maybe he's lost that $45,000, but if he restores his relationship with his wife, promises to go to Gamblers Anonymous if he needs it or gets other help and will do everything he can to make up for that. He can restore the relationship. And confession is an important step in restoring our relationship. If you stay cut off from God and the relationship, you'll end up in hell because you're cutting yourself off from that personal relationship with God by sin. So that's the way you have to look at it, okay? Well, we have an email from Tad in Connecticut. Father, today we celebrate St. Mark, whose gospel account is the shortest of the gospels. St. Mark recounts the life of Jesus very vividly, so I'm curious about him. St. Mark is not one of the 12 apostles, I know. My question is, who was St. Mark? One of St. Peter's letters reveals Mark was a follower of Peter, whom Peter refers to as his son. Was Mark witness to Jesus' teachings directly? 
Tad in Connecticut. No, Tad. He, St. Mark was a disciple of St. Peter. As I mentioned earlier, he was also called by the Greek fathers of the church in the first century. He was called, in first and second century, he was called Peter's amanuensis. That is secretary. So he's given this very vivid, uh, you, 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 you have his character down well, but he's given this very vivid uh, gospel as a report from St. Peter. Peter was his source for what he wrote down. And he put that down on papyrus for St. Peter in Rome. Well, Peter and Mark were there. And then St. Peter sent St. Mark to the great city of uh, um, Alexandria, Egypt, and he started the church there. Alexandria was the second largest city in the empire, an extremely important, great center of learning, both Jewish and Greek learning. So he went there and started the church, and that is why the church in Alexandria is a patriarchal church rooted in Peter through his disciple Mark, okay, who wrote the gospel. All right. Thank you all, and on this Feast of St. Mark, may the good Lord bless you and keep you and give you deep insight into the, His Gospel and all the sacred scriptures. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, because that was how Mother Angelica was inspired by our Lord to have this network keep on going. And your generosity enables us to do this show and all the other shows as well. God bless you all and keep you and thank you. Hi everyone, Father Calloway here with day 28 of our 33-day preparation for total consecration to St. Joseph. In the Litany of St. Joseph we pray, Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Life is filled with many sorrows, many afflictions. Loved ones die, children rebel, and gravity eventually takes away our youthfulness, making us old and immobile. No matter what life brings, however, St. Joseph will always be our consolation, comfort, and solace. God wants you to rest in St. Joseph's fatherhood. St. Joseph will never abandon you. When life has you down, run to your spiritual father. Pour out your heart to him. Tell him your troubles. My friends, let's go to St. Joseph. Get your copy of Consecration to St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father at EWTNRC.com. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. You expired, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O font of life, unfathomable